This story may shock you, unless you're a school teacher, and then it's probably just another day at the office. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Every teacher, teacher's aide, janitor, nurse, bus driver, and principal know whatever mood a student brings to school from home that morning will set the stage for that entire school day. If you've been an educator for very long, you can predict how a student's day will go from across the room. Charles Schultz's Peanuts character with a rain cloud over his head is a great visual. Many times, a student would come into the building with a gigantic chip on their shoulder. When the first teacher notices the pending storm, it would set in motion the teacher network. Each teacher would warm the next to be on the lookout and not to be blindsided. One student in a deep enough funk can make a teacher's life miserable. About 80 years ago, Abraham Maslow published his Hierarchy of Needs. From a time shortly after, educators have been tortured with this theory to explain why students behave the way they do. Now teachers, please don't click off. I'll make this short. Essentially, and I oversimplify, the theory states that a student's basic needs must be met before learning can succeed. Starting with food, then shelter and safety, Maslow's hierarchy of needs describes five levels that must be satisfied. Every introductory book on the behavior will show a pyramid dedicated to Maslow. Interestingly, Maslow's original work didn't contain any pyramids. But I wander off topic a bit. Now for today's story. I was in a part of the building where the acoustics were very good. It was during the middle of first period, and in this location, even a principal should have the expectation of some privacy. Unfortunately, I had clipped my radio to my belt before I'd left my office to answer the call of nature. The infernal gadget was currently yelling at me from under my slacks, which were presently draped over my shoes. My secretary was trying to find me so I might deal with a student problem. If she had any idea what she was interrupting, the images would have scarred her for life. The student was sitting outside my office in one of the several sturdy wooden chairs placed there. These chairs occasionally had happy students awaiting my return to report something pleasant. Sometimes, teachers wanting to bend my ear would wait patiently there for me. But most often, they were chairs students occupied during their cool-down while they waited to discuss some poor choice they'd made. Many of these students were referred to affectionately as frequent flyers. As I rounded the corner, I saw one of my favorite frequent flyers. Little Johnny was sitting in the chair, elbows on his knees and his head in his hands. I'd swear I could see storm clouds whirling and boiling above his head. Charles Schultz would be proud. Walking by him into my office, he never looked up. He never moved. Sensing his cooling off might not be complete, I let him stay out in the hallway for a few more minutes. Checking on him periodically, it didn't seem his demeanor was improving. If anything, his agitation appeared to be increasing. Finally, after a few minutes, I invited him into my office. He got to his feet very deliberately, then slowly trudged into my office. He sort of lowered himself into his chair without relaxing and never made eye contact. Since this was not his maiden voyage to the principal's office, I had some history dealing with him. The trick, well, really more the art to a successful interview with a student like Johnny, was to gather his side of the story without the student erupting like Mount Vesuvius. This tightrope was trickier with students like little Johnny, as they seemed to fixate on whatever he could to create an argument. The challenge was not to be drawn into that argument. Don't ask me how I know. Since much of my responsibility was dealing with discipline, I tried to make use of my office as a distraction. Pictures of me running a marathon, a selfie of me with the Statue of Liberty, and other items littered the office walls. The idea was to de-escalate the student with outside stimuli, letting the student look around the room or even better encouraging them to ask about something they were looking at might ease the student's anxiety. Sometimes I think it helped. Little Johnny sat there quietly while I read over the incident notes from the teacher. He never looked up. It was reported that Little Johnny's class had been divided up into groups to complete an assignment. The report said Little Johnny began arguing with Little Susie, another member of his group. Before the teacher or anyone else could intervene, Little Johnny yells, F*** you, bitch. 
The teacher naturally stepped in to break up the bickering and instructed Johnny to get your stuff and go to the office now. The notes go on to say little Johnny grabs his backpack, knocking pens and paper off his desk and onto the floor. As he reaches for the door, he announces to the class, this is bad. I stare at Johnny on the other side of my desk. He continued to look at the floor. While it wasn't unusual for him to argue with a classmate, a teacher, or even me, it was curious that he would be so self-destructive. He was smart enough to know this kind of outburst would not go down well. I wondered if maybe the teacher had embellished what had happened. It wouldn't be the first time. Well, Johnny, I started. Your teacher tells me you used some pretty inappropriate language in class this morning. What do you have to say for yourself? Little Johnny doesn't look up. Unrepentant, he speaks into his lap. I don't care what she says. I'm not going to talk about it. At this point, I could have retrieved our discipline matrix, gone to the part about profanity, considered the previous offenses, and doled out his punishment. Instead, my spidey senses, or gut feeling, or whatever you want to call it, was telling me something wasn't right. I let a few moments pass before I said, Johnny? He didn't look up. Finally, I carefully say, Son, what is going on with you? He slowly looked up. When his eyes met mine, he burst into tears. His wailing and crying were loud enough everyone else in the office came to my open door to make sure everything was okay. I waved the people back away from my office because I was afraid they might embarrass him. Little Johnny eventually cried himself out. Once he finished his emotional eruption, he was much more conversational. Turns out little Johnny was awakened on this morning by the police. His mother and father had gotten into a fight before school after his father had come home from a night of drinking. From what I could gather, this was a common occurrence. What wasn't so common was on this day, his father chose to beat the heck out of his mother. Fortunately, a neighbor called the police. The police arrived and took Johnny's father into custody. Before they could take him to jail, they had to wait for the grandmother so someone would be there to take care of Johnny and his little sister. The paramedics had long since carted little Johnny's mother to the emergency ward. I knew the grandmother and had spoken to her before. You know, frequent flyer and all. She corroborated little Johnny's story, adding, in addition to everything going on, he got both himself and his sister ready for school. She said, by the time I got to their house, he and his sister were leaving to go to the bus stop. I did my best to empathize with Johnny that morning. Every opportunity to strengthen a relationship is important. I told him how sorry I was for his troubles at home. Johnny, and students like him, have a very tough exterior and usually don't trust authority. I let little Johnny stay in my office until he thought he was ready to go back to class, after first period. Without sharing specifics, I contacted the rest of his teachers, asking them to keep an eye on little Johnny, instructing them to contact me immediately if he appeared to be struggling. I was glad it was Friday. This would give all the parties time to move on to the next crisis. Little Johnny got a break on his discipline that day. Goodness knows he needed a break. You never know what burden a student is bringing with them to school. It's amazing he was at school at all. Maslow would tell you little Johnny and his sister would have trouble being successful because of a lack of safety and security. He would be right. The number of students in a similar situation to little Johnny and his sister is staggering. You can't make this stuff up.